Genesis chapter 7. Last time we were together for Genesis, we uh, looked at the preparation for the flood. The Noah's call to prepare, his faithfulness to believe the Lord at his word, that he would make this judgment, even though in that situation, looking back at what we've already studied in Genesis, in that situation, what the Lord was telling him must have sounded ludicrous. <laughs> This has sounded insane. Because at, when we were in Genesis 1, we looked at some of the scientific background of what we're reading. Namely, that the world was not as it is. It, it's the antediluvian time, if you want the big scientific word, which basically means pre-flood. The world was vastly different. We didn't have rain. We didn't have weather patterns. We actually had a canopy, a vapor barrier around the world that just protected us from the harmful rays of the sun. It maintained the climate to almost like it was Hawaii everywhere. There was no rain. There was no weather patterns. I, I would go so far as there probably wasn't any wind. It was a perfect greenhouse worldwide. And with this perfect environment came better health. People lived so much longer. The plants and the, basically flood irrigation was the standard for every plant, wild or farmed around the world. The, the rain didn't come down, water sprung up from the ground. And so when God came to Noah and said, Noah, it's time, I'm going to judge the world. Everybody's become sinful. Their hearts are nowhere near me. They have no desire to follow me. They have no desire to seek after me. They become violent. We read through those genealogies that it became, it became a moral line of thought that, Al, you hurt me, I'll kill you. And so... The world morals had just gone haywire. So the Lord came to Noah and said, that's it. We're hitting the hard reset button. We're, I'm, I'm starting over now. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to make it rain. What's rain? And with that rain, I'm going to flood all the earth. Everything with the breath of life will be drowned out. What's a flood? is likely what Noah's thought process was here. What's rain? What's a flood? But he believed God regardless. A similar thought pattern would be if God came to one of us and says, I'm wiping the population again. I'm going to remove all air on the planet. Here's what I want you to do. I'm sure everybody in here would think they've gone insane. <laughs> but this is... What Noah heard the word of God, and as we see in the book of Hebrews, his faith, his, he believed God. His faith was what made him righteous. It wasn't because he obeyed. It wasn't because he did this or that or he was a great guy. It was because he had faith. He trusted the Lord at his word. So, Noah obeyed. God fulfilled his promise from making it rain to even bringing the animals to him. And now the rain starts in Genesis chapter 7. Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. You shall take with you every clean animal by sevens, a male and his, fe his female, and the animals that are not clean too, a male and his female. Also the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days I will send rain on the earth. Forty days and forty nights I will blot out from the face of the land, every living thing that I have made. Stopping there.
in our time frame, in our not understanding of the text, hindsight's twenty twenty. We have a general idea of what clean animals are. But I just want to point out the law hasn't been given. So the idea of clean animals, though it's not in the text, I'm sure had to be explained. <laughs> and we'll see later that there's a specific point about multiple birds. We're going to see a little bit of explanation in that also. But I, the apologetics of me really latches on to one specific verse, and that's where we stopped at here. For after seven more days, I will send rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. This story is one of the hardest stories for even Christians, Bible-believing Christians, to latch on to because it is one of the most contested scientifically. You can talk to many Christians and you can say, do you believe the Bible? Yes. So you believe some guy built a big boat. And that's where the thought process starts to kick in. Oh, they're going to challenge me on this. Because the idea, science will say what it wants to say and people will challenge this. The idea of a global flood is just ludicrous to the unbeliever. But I want to challenge this. One with the ch text here. God has repeatedly said, I am going to wipe out all life. I'm going to wipe out everything. Knowing you and your family and the animals I brought to you are going to be the only living things when I'm done. He's repeated it over and over and over. And right here, as he's telling him, time, clock's ticking. In seven days, I'm wiping everything out. The text should be enough for most believers. The other thing I want to challenge believers, if they're having trouble believing that this actually happened, is do you believe Jesus? Do you believe what Jesus said? If so, Jesus compared this very event in his own words to his second coming. <laughs> he said, just as life was wiped out. Everybody was marrying and giving in marriage. Everybody was going about their day, and then the rain came. So will be my return. So either you believe Jesus or you're calling him a liar. Now let's take a few supports outside of the text. I don't like getting political, but I'm going to for a moment. Anybody heard of global warming? What is the big thing everybody is afraid of with global warming? The ice caps are going to melt and we're all going to die. Why are we going to all die? Because the sea levels will rise and the land will be flooded. Huh. So it couldn't happen back in the Bible times. But it could now. Remember what I told you about how the world was pre-flood. Everywhere around the world, paradise, greenhouse-like temperatures. Everything's great. There wasn't even really any weather. There also wasn't any ice caps, which leads to, okay, if there was a giant flood, where'd the water go? We see in Psalm, you might have to help me, Anybody that can remember the reference here? I think it's Psalm 104. It describes the very flood. The waters rose, and then God commanded them to recede back to where they, they can, drew the line where they would go. It came off the mountains and into the valleys. What we're seeing there is a picture of the world was flooded, job's done, judgment has been given, the waters recede. 
Where? Down into the valleys, down into the deep, is what the Hebrew, the Hebrew text actually says. The va- it went from the mountains to the deep. Well, if you're not aware, the oceans are quite deep. Now that there's weather patterns, now we have low cold fronts, hot, hot fronts, low and high pressures. We had ice caps develop. The very ice caps that people freaking out about global warming will say we're going to melt and flood us and kill us all. (laughs) Where did the water go? Into the depths of the ocean and into the ice caps. With that rant, what we're seeing here is that the Bible doesn't just throw out a crazy story. There is basis in ways that we can see, yes, this happened. Fossil records will show animals that were fossilized, which science will tell you takes a lot of pressure and a lot of time. Please explain to me how a mammoth can be unearthed, almost perfectly preserved, flash frozen, with the food still in its stomach. (laughs) That doesn't sound like a lot of time. The Bible isn't fairy tales. It's not mythology. It's a record of our world. Rant, stop. Let's move forward here. <laughs> I will blot out from the face of every, li- every living thing that I have made. Verse 5. Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. Noah Now Noah was 600 years old when the flood water came upon the earth. Then Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him entered the ark because the water of the water of the flood. Of clean animals and animals that are not clean and birds and everything that creeps on the ground, there went into the ark to Noah by twos, female, male and female, as God had commanded Noah came about after seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. And some of my research on this and listening to other pastors with their take on this, this is often brought up as a conflict or a contradiction here in just these couple of verses. We start out... <clears throat> Noah did according, now, uh, then Noah and his, wa- his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered the ark of the water because of the water of the flood. Of clean animals and animals that are not clean, they all went in two by two. It came about after seven days, the water of the flood came upon the earth. When did Noah go into the ark? He went into the ark as commanded. Animals went in, but it says because of the flood water. So was the flood waters already there? A couple of verses later, it says that the flood waters came. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I read pages of different pastors arguing about was it already flooding when he went in, or would the flood waters come after they went in? Why people argue about these t- little bitty details, I will never understand. But, to clarify, God said in seven days it's going to rain. Well, everybody get on the boat. (laughs) Noah doesn't necessarily know what floods are or rain, but God said it's coming and we need on the boat. Let's go, people. Come on. (laughs) Also note, Noah's 600 years old at this point. I know some of us could feel like we're 600 years old, and my kids probably think I'm 600 years old, but 600 years old, and he has built basically a life raft for the end of the world. Now he's wrangling animals, every animal, plus he's got his wife, his kids, and his kids' wives. If you have ever stuck family together long enough, that's going to be frustrating, (laughs) But here we are, 600 years old, getting on this ark. And we're going to see that this was not just 40 days on a boat. 
It wasn't a month-long vacation. By the time they actually were able to depart, we're talking a year. So, by the measurements, this ark was about the size of basically a warehouse. With every creature, bug, bird, everything, at least two of each, some more, wife, three sons, their wives, crammed into this space for one year. Just take a moment and think about that. If if you've ever been crammed in a car for a long road trip, let's have that road trip take a year. (laughs) Animals are still eating. Animals are still doing what comes after eating. So is the family. I'm bored. When is this going to be over? I thought you said 40 days. (laughs) One of the other things just throwing out here real quick, is a lot of people say, why didn't the animals kill each other? You got a lion next to a lamb on a boat for a year. Text doesn't specifically say why, but I'm going to just throw this one out here as just a leap of thought. As we already discussed, Noah didn't go out and get the animals. God led the animals to him. Now, if you can get a penguin to travel half a world away, I think he can keep it from doing something stupid for a year. (laughs) Just as he could do lions and everything else, I just wish most of the insects didn't make it on the boat. But here we are. (laughs) If clean animals and and are not clean birds and every every creeping thing (coughs) came about after the seven days, verse 10, that the flood water came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were opened. The rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. So, Noah is 600 years old. In the second month, the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep opened. We're estimating this to be roughly 5,000 years, 5,000 B.C. The second month on a Hebrew calendar, the 17th day, I believe that falls the 17th of March. 5,000 B.C., (laughs) give or take a few years. The floodgates open in the sky, and the great deep bursts open. So that vapor barrier we talked about in Genesis 1 collapses. All these natural springs that we talked about that were watering the garden and watering the earth erupt like geysers. The great deep is bursted open. We, this is where our oceans quite literally are created. You can take a look at the world map and see that with a little work in the mental picturing here, and some people have even done like computer-generated versions of it, the land masses can come together like a puzzle. Continental shift is a scientific fact. We know they know that it happens. This is why we have earthquakes. I think the crust of the earth was actually solid before the flood. <laughs> there was no plates. This all came about in this moment. God said in seven days it's the flood's coming. They get on the boat, the floodgates of the heavens open. First time ever we're seeing rain. The earth is literally breaking apart and water is gushing forward. So this flood was not, it rained for a little bit. 
and then it started getting really wet, and then puddles started becoming flowing streams. No, this was an instant thing. The waters burst forward from the ground. The heavens floodgates broke open. The water was everywhere quickly. (laughs) Rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and their three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They they and every beast of its kind and all the cattle after their kind and creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird of after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh in which was the breath of life. Those that entered, male and female and all flesh, entered as God has commanded him, and the Lord closed it behind him. So, once again, is this a contradiction in Scripture? We just read that they were on the boat, then the waters came. And then we're reading that they're entering the boat. I know I keep saying boat. It was technically an ark. It wasn't actually shaped like a boat. But it's easier to say boat when we're talking about floating on water. (laughs) Is this a contradiction? Well, you're already going to be there for a year. They entered the ark. They made their arrangements. Let's save ourselves seven days of fecal matter from all these animals. We can keep the door open. (laughs) but it was at this time last call everybody in and then we see something different here the flood came upon the sky back up those entered male and female all flesh entered as God commanded them and they closed the door no just seeing if everybody's reading along. <laughs> None of the instructions that was given to Noah talked about an actual way to close the door. The Lord closed the door behind them. The Lord closed it behind them. Then the flood came upon the earth for 40 days and the water priest and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. Just a little reference here. Rose above the earth. The tallest landmass that we have on this planet. I guarantee everybody here would die of suffocation. What we're talking about here is to be well above mountain ranges. Well above any landmass that could be there. So if we're just taking the world as we know it now, that's about 20,000 feet up. Just kind of, I'm just trying to get an idea in your head of just the catastrophe we're looking at, the devastation we're looking at. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed 15 cubits higher and the mountains were covered. So, Just trying to do some mental gymnastics here. A cubit is about 18 inches. So we're looking roughly 30 feet above the highest mountain range. (laughs) 22 and a half, thank you. Sorry. I wasn't ever that great at math. All the flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. Of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils the breath of the spirit of life died. Thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things to birds of the sky, 
They were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah was left, together with those that went into the ark with him. Water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. So, what we're seeing here, is just the links of this judgment is just, it, it boggles my mind. <laughs> I don't know if it does for everybody else or if it's years of being told this story just kind of desensitizes you to what's going on here, but God was grieved at what was going on. And to show us the costs of our sin. This beautiful creation that he made. He is willing to wipe the slate clean. To just lay judgment upon all the earth. And just reading those words that he was grieved at the state mankind had gotten to the the violent was violence was so prevalent the moral morality was so skewed and thrown off that man's heart was far from him and then to read later on jesus basically saying this is going to happen again but it's not going to be with water it's going to be my return and to read that god was grieved then and that a similar judgment, not the same one, but a similar judgment like what we just read is to come again. This isn't because I feel that we often forget that God has the emotions. He, he loves his creation. But sin has ripped us apart. I'm having trouble kind of putting the words together in my head here and trying to get them out to you guys. But the judgment that is to come in the end times is not an easy decision for God to make either. It's not a thing that he wants to have to happen. But us as mankind, not necessarily us in this room, but mankind in general, the human race, he's giving them the chance to make their decisions. He's given them the chance to choose him or their own way. The hard road or the easy way out. And so, just seeing this story, and especially those words right at the beginning of this, the beginning of Noah's story here, that the emphasis I, I, I feel is placed in that simple statement, the Lord was grieved. I know a lot of translations are going to say he repented. But God doesn't change his mind. Repented is a poor translation for that line. He was grieved. He ached. It broke his heart to see what his creation had become. And Christ's words comparing this to the end times, to his second coming, the Armageddon, the final judgment, that the world will go through this again, and that pain that was there, just thinking about how this, I was going to end up here, I was actually starting to tear up, really thinking about it, and I'm trying to clearly convey that. <laughs> And you guys have heard all of us pastors up here emphasize the time is near. I often feel like we, we sound like crazy guys on the side of the street screaming at people, but how else can we convey that it's at any moment, at any time? You're not guaranteed to even finish the sentence you may be speaking. You may not finish the breath you are taking in an instant.
time could be up. And I just want us to, as Dad was saying, start taking your Christian walk, your 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 personal walk, your po- personal devotion to Christ. Make it the priority. Make it serious. As Paul says, at all times, be in the attitude of prayer. Be ready to make a defense. I'm not the greatest at quoting specifically the, a scripture by the ver- chapter verse. Never have been. Barely got through that part of Bible school. <laughs> Bible references aren't my thing, but I can tell you what it says. I may not be correct on where it is, but I can tell you what it says. Dad is at the point where I almost wasn't going to be able to make it tonight. Eh, Give me 10 minutes to get something together. I wish I could do that. (laughs) But I just want everybody to understand that this is coming again, and I want us to be prepared. I want us to spread the word to get that message across that we're not guaranteed another moment. Next week we're going to pick up chapter 8 and we're going to look at what happens after that year on that boat. (laughs) A year of waiting out the judgment. We're going to see where God starts making yet another covenant with mankind, one that we sometimes overlook, I think. But we'll look at that next week. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for another opportunity to be sharing your word, to be in your word, to be sharing what you have taught me. Lord, I just want to thank everybody that's here, and I just hope that the message was 